2020 is drawn to a close and what a year has turned out to be. After the struggles of the pandemic, many of us had high hopes that this would finally be the year that everything went back to normal. But the world had other plans. War broke out in Europe. Inflation came back with a bang, turning markets upside down. And for anyone who follows British politics, the pantomime has been hard to put into words. Westminster turned out to be weirder than a winter World Cup. All that aside, 2022 was a big year for climate. There were challenges from chaotic weather to the drama of another cop. But there were also some big steps forward and a few hidden silver linings. This year has been full of climate lessons and we need to reflect on them if we're going to see the progress we need in 2023. So here's our year in climate review. The overarching climate theme of 2022 for me has been interconnectivity. This felt like a year where for the first time climate change broke out of its silo to become an integral part of politics, economics and our cultural conversations. No debate quite felt complete without talking about its implications for net zero. That is the single best thing that's happened in the space for an awful long time. This came home to me in the first half of this year when we saw the return of history in Europe. War and inflation, two things Europeans thought had been banished to the past, came back with a bang. As restrictions placed on Russian oil and gas and post-pandemic supply chains conspired to create a major energy crisis. Nord Stream, energy security, grid resilience and import dependency were suddenly back on the agenda. But this time climate concerns were at the heart of the debate too. Yes, Germany, Italy and others started talking about restarting coal stations. The UK wanted to begin fracking, but the criticism they faced was unprecedented. Others were debating whether we could afford the clean energy transition at all. But at least there was a debate, and not one that traditionalists were winning. Instead, many rediscovered the geopolitical virtues of renewables, that they don't rely on complex global networks or the good favour of regimes that we don't wish to be dependent on. Green energy security became a thing. Ultimately, the IEA ended the year forecasting the war would speed up rather than slow down the transition to renewables in Europe over the long term. Hardly the outcome that anyone interested in the long term future of Russian petrochemicals wanted, but a valuable reminder that everything is connected, often unexpectedly so. This summer felt like a moment when climate change really came home to many, and not in a good way. Across the world, from Europe to China to North America, Record heat waves brought life to a standstill, and many parts of continental Europe were devastated by forest fires. The oversimplified story of this, being the coolest summer you will ever see, has a grain of truth. While some variations in temperature is inevitable, the trend is unquestionably up. By contrast, the worst floods ever to hit Pakistan left over a third of the country underwater, devastating lives and livelihoods in millions. A spate of cyclones and tropical storms ravaged coastal Africa and the Pacific, and Hurricane Ian devastated the Caribbean and Florida. All these events remind us that the climate change is too weak a term for the disaster that's already arrived. From Pakistan to Madagascar, China to France, people were confronted with climate breakdown. Sadly, the story of interconnectivity here is not a happy one. Europe was shaken out of its complacency with a reminder that no matter how temperate your climate, you'll not go untouched by chaotic weather. Meanwhile, we saw the worst impacts fall on the people with the least stark responsibility for climate emissions. The suffering in the global south is a tragic reflection of the fact that we all share one future, regardless of our divergent pasts. In America, President Joe Manchin, sorry, Joe Biden, finally passed the Inflation Reduction Act, the first major piece of green legislation in years. And there's a lot of good in it, not least the 369 billion for renewables, electric vehicles, and new clean technologies. 
hopefully it'll kickstart the new wave of green investment we badly need. That said, this is not the Green New Deal that many had hoped for, and a whole lot of compromises were needed to get IRA passed. Offshore drilling was restarted in the Gulf and in Alaska, and a quadrupling of their 45Q tax credits for carbon capture and storage will inevitably allow business as usual for longer for the oil majors. This might also be the last significant climate law we see in the US for many years. The 2022 midterms were seen as an outperformance for the Democrats, but still underlined how difficult the Senate map will be for the next six to eight years. So unless climate stops being a partisan issue, we back to climate policy by executive order, if anything at all. Despite his compromises, IRA is overall a win for net zero. And if given a chance to deliver, should seed new industries and jobs, which would be hard for any incoming government to undo. Meanwhile, the EU was also busy passing landmark climate reforms of its own. It agreed a massive reduction in free allowances flowing through the emissions trading scheme which should go a long way to fixing the world's premier carbon market. But the prize for policy of the year 2022 goes to a late entrance, the announcement of a European carbon border tax. Imported carbon has long been the problem child of national carbon accounting and taxation, and the approach until now has been to largely close our eyes and ignore it. With the introduction of a genuine border adjustment mechanism, we now have one of the last pieces needed to put a true price on carbon. Once it gets going, expect big changes to the economy, a topic we'll dig deeper into with a guest in the new year. The most interesting thing about the policy game in Europe and the US this year has been, again, its interconnectivity. That's just a polite way of saying that we're in the early rounds of an almighty transatlantic spat over climate and trade. Ira led Europe to cry foul over the impact of the green subsidies on competition in state aid. I suspect it sharpened a few minds in Brussels who may be planning a European equivalent support mechanism. The carbon border tax is sure to add fuel to the flames. I actually think this is a great thing. For the first time, we're seeing the world's major economies feel the pressure of forward-looking policy passed elsewhere. And for the first time, we're seeing them compete on who can get greener, faster. Competition is an important kind of connection. He's hoping that 2023 sees more of the same. If this is a good year for climate competition, I'm not sure we can say the same for climate cooperation. COP27 landed in Egypt in November, and it was largely a bust. I've written a lot about the failures of the COP process in the last few months, and I'm not gonna repeat it all here. But simply put, the process is just no longer fit for purpose. Yes, there was a headline win on loss and damage, a critical and long overdue part of the climate justice story. We've gone way too many years without recognizing the deep inequalities in historic responsibility for climate, as well as the unfair distribution of likely impacts. But as with so much in the global climate process, we need to back up big talk with some genuine action. In 2009, we were promised to build to 100 billion a year for the Green Climate Fund by 2020. Now, in 2023, we spent a sum total of 2 billion. Will it be any different this time? Early signs aren't great. Similarly, for all the grand promises baked into the NDCs, which are the individual countries' commitments to reducing emissions, 2022 saw carbon emissions climb to record highs once again. 37.5 billion tons. This is the one measure that counts above all, and it's showing us that we're still failing miserably. 1.5 degrees may still be alive as an idea, but it's all but dead in practice. At current rates, we'll blow through this in just nine years. For all that connection is my climate theme of the year, this stood out as the biggest disconnect by far. And it starts at the top, with what be has become an empty talking shop a cop? Unless we turn words into actions and get this one right, nothing else matters. Nevertheless, even as 1.5 degree dies before our eyes, we still have a duty to do all we can for future generations. Every fraction of a degree counts. When I think of my children and the many wonderful young people I encounter in life, this is the connection that matters. 
I sincerely hope that we take the lessons from 22 and emissions will finally turn the corner next year. With all that said, the year drew to a close with two fascinating glimpses into a potentially more hopeful future. The first is the announcement of a breakthrough on nuclear fusion, which finally managed to produce a positive energy gain in a lab experiment. Fusion has long been seen as one of the outside hopes for clean energy, and there was a lot of excitement at the news. We have to celebrate scientific discovery, but we'd also be wary of pinning our hopes on something that may still be decades out from commercial viability, if at all. There are also certainly many questions to be answered, and this is another topic we'll be exploring in depth in the new year. The second piece of underreported news was the Biodiversity COP in Montreal. Here, 190 countries agreed to 30 by 30 to protect 30% of the world's lands and oceans for nature by 2030. Hopefully this is the start of a revolution in our attitudes to regenerating nature. Taking together the news on fusion and on the Biodiversity COP offers both hope and a warning. Yes, we can still make progress but we must recognize that we cannot focus on one area in isolation. Even if we get cheap, limitless and clean fusion power in a decade or three, will that solve all our environmental problems? No. It might fix the climate puzzle, but if we use it as an excuse to return to business as usual, then it will only lead us to destroy our planets in faster ways. Climate, nature, biodiversity, water, all our planetary boundaries are connected. To solve one, we must face them all. This is the real test of our theme of connectivity in the coming years. Finally, I couldn't close out our view of the year without reflecting on our podcast itself. Conversations on climate was just an idea I was throwing around with the kids a year ago. Today is perhaps my single biggest source of hope and optimism. We've had such incredible guests and such fascinating conversations across all sorts of areas. We've connected climate to purpose, good judgment to game theory, microalgae to big data, clean tech to activism. These are the conversations we should be having. And I want to sincerely thank each and every guest who has generously given their time and their wisdom. Conversations make a difference. For example, the idea of taxing carbon at borders was seen as crazy, too radical, too interventionist, too unworkable. For decades, the idea only existed in conversations amongst academics, activists, and those who spoke up for a policy they believed in. And now, 2023, we can finally say the idea has become policy in the leading trading bloc in the world. The impact it will have will be huge, what would it not have happened without all those conversations? They matter. Overall, the thing I'm most proud of is the community we've built. We started with a few hundred listeners on our first episode seven months ago. And now our latest release reached over 100,000 views in its first few days. This is a wonderful network. And every listener and subscriber I've had the pleasure to talk to has made me realize we're all connecting into something really special. Your comments and emails are wonderful, and I love receiving them. But all of you by tuning in are part of this conversation. By downloading, by subscribing, by sharing the show, by reaching out to the guests, and by taking these ideas out into your businesses and communities, you're making it all happen. This has been the biggest teacher of interconnection to me this year. Long may it continue into 2023. I can't wait to see you there.